Let's talk. Spencer and Zach Explore the Universe is brought to you by Maine Spirits. Learn more about the delicious spirits they bring into the great state of Maine and what you can make with them at mainspirits.com. On Instagram at Maine underscore spirits or download their app for your smartphone. Stay tuned at the end of the show for happy hour. Spencer and Zach Explore the Universe is also brought to you by Bull Moose. Now open for safe distance shopping. Get all of your music, movies, gaming, books, and pop culture needs at Bull Moose. With dozens of locations peppered throughout Maine and New Hampshire. Or shop from home at bullmoose.com. Also by State Theatre Portland, Maine. Though State Theatre is closed for concerts at present, they are still working to bring you the best music entertainment and the comfort and safety of your home. Visit statetheater.com for more information, show schedules, and merchandise. And by the Maine Music Alliance, a Maine-based nonprofit dedicated to the preservation of Maine's independent music venues. Learn more and donate at mainemusicalliance.org. And by Sun Tiki Studios, a top-notch rehearsal and performance space on Forest Avenue in Portland. Though closed for concerts for the time being, Sun Tiki Studios is open for safe distance rehearsals. Learn more and book time at suntikistudios.com. Nice. Here we are on the, well, this is Monday, if you're listening to it when it came out. When this came out, it's Monday. It's the Monday after John Lennon's 80th birthday, which also saw the release of Give Me, Give Me, <laughs> Give Me <laughs> Some Truth, Give Me Some Truth, give me. which is a new collection of uh, remixed John Lennon songs. And uh, I got the... Uh, the vinyl version from Bull Moose, which is uh, eighteen. I'm sorry, nineteen songs. And then uh, I went on Spotify, and they they have other versions as well that uh, cost more money than than I'm making. Uh, you know, flipping flapjacks here on the internet. So, uh, but uh, yeah, this nineteen song version is what I have, and then there's a, another box set that's larger, and then I went on Spotify and realized that, uh, man, they remixed a lot of these tunes. That deluxe version on Spotify is huge. Uh, I ended up getting the four LP set. Oh, damn! Uh, be- because I'm currently living with mom and dad. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, what's and, your side uh, hustle, yeah, that- man? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just flipping flapjacks <laughs> so here on the internet. Um, <laughs> and that's yeah, uh, thirty six, thirty six tracks in all. But I did uh, realize, you know, there there are a whole bunch of different versions of this, uh, you know, between the CDs and the LPs and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but apparently, the LP set doesn't come with the one hundred and twenty four page booklet that like the other ones do, which it I was actually not. really interested in. I was a little disappointed to open up that box and not find that book in there. Yeah, I'm actually interested to talk to you about that. Um, and then also we should mention that we have a we have a uh, we're a thruple today uh, yes. on the on the show, and we have Steve Drown, who is uh, hi hi Steve. I am here. I'm here in my <laughs> hi, uh, my COVID nineteen hideaway in mm-hmm. Deering Center. The co- the COVID cave. Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> um, well, hopefully it's not a cave full of COVID. Yeah. Are there any bats in there? <laughs> no, no, no. I think I think I'm safe. I had the windows open yesterday because mm-hmm. it was you know 75 degrees, but I closed them and sucked all the COVID out overnight. So. Yeah, good, good. You get the you get Co- the uh, coronavirus, the Renai COVID yeah. sucker. Yep, COVID yep. remover. Uh, uh, so I think it's oh maybe you're already going to do what I was just about to do. <laughs> uh, the, the Steve intro. That's right. You go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, oh, go right. Uh, so for our uh, our ever growing fan base, I think we've moved up from five to six fans now. Wow. Um, so yeah. Uh, I'm one Steve. Of them. You are a, uh, I'm going to inform you as well as the listeners, Steve <laughs> is a, uh, <laughs> a recording engineer, mix engineer, um, among others. He's worked with Spencer Albee and Zach Jones. Wow. <laughs> but, uh, wow. What a roster. Wow. Yeah. B- big, big moves. <laughs> uh, but also you did a lot of work with Eugene McDaniels, which correct me if I'm wrong, but that yep. also led to you recording with Ron Carter and yep. people of, of, of that ilk. Um, you also worked for Bose, correct? As a contractor, uh, yes, for six years, mm-hmm. doing all their original demonstration material. Right on, and that was like recording or- and mixing orchestras. It or was all everything. Sorts of stuff? Uh, wild 
re- recording lions and leopards and tigers oh my. and orchestras, Celtic music, a Welsh choir, um, which has a long story to go with it, um, birds in an aviary. Wow. Uh, it's kind of recording downtown Worcester. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Um, additionally, um, you've recorded, uh, you've worked with Charlie Musselwhite. Do I have that right? Uh, yeah, for a, a good stretch of time, I was the engineer um, on a bunch of Telarc, you know, the audiophile label Telarc's blues division, did probably half of their releases. So I worked with Charlie Musselwhite a number of times, a, a number of times, James Cotton a number of mm-hmm, times, mm-hmm. Hubert Sumlin, Pine Top Perkins, uh, a ton of people through that. It was pretty f- Lots of fun working with these people I used to read about, and then you get to hang out with them. Um, did you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but did you do some recording with Alison Krauss and Robert Plant? Uh, no, I, I was... did not. I, I, I hung out with Robert Plant, and I met oh. Alison, which was very exciting, right when they were doing the record. But So yeah, I met Robert Plant before that record came out, and I wish I worked on it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I yeah. thought maybe I, you were involved. I, with, would, uh, I would finally oh. have had a Grammy in, instead of nominations. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> So, but well, you know, at least uh, you're nominated. Something. I've never been nominated <laughs> uh, for Grammy. Well, nor have I. Um, I have a, a short anecdote uh, about Steve. Well, Steve, you know, and Zach and I have worked together. We'll just say countless hundreds of hours. Count. Yes. I mean, just. Yeah. I mean, probably if you crammed all the time that we've spent together in a studio into one hunk of time, it would be substantial months if not a year. <laughs> uh, but uh, I got a call from Steve one day that was basically like, you should come down here to the studio. He was the chief engineer of at the time called cleverly the studio. Right. And um, it was the nineties. Uh, and uh, on that session that day were the following uh, G E Smith and from the Saturday Night Live like, band, and uh, also the Hall and Oates band, and the Hall and Oates band. Speaking of that, T Bone Walk uh, on bass, and then uh, most dazzling to me at the time, uh, Steve Holly, who was the drummer in the last uh, incarnation of Wings. And I don't know. There's an argument to be made that he was Wings' best drummer, but they had so many good drummers; they're all great. Yeah. But Steve Holly was excellent. And yeah, so I came down and coiled cables and made coffee and was just a, an assistant that day. And then next thing you know, the next day I was uh, recording with Steve Holly, which was the coolest. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah that was a fun <laughs> moment. Like I felt like, wow, like I'm, I don't know. I was I was in my early twenties at that time, right? Like uh, you'll have to uh, probably. How was, old was I? I? I'm a baby. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You tell me. <laughs> tell me how prob- old I was. <laughs> it was probably the year the in the year two thousand maybe. In the year or tw- 19, wow. Two thousand one maybe at the not right around there. Yeah, right around two thousand one. Yeah. You guys were floating yeah. around in a space station recording that. That's right. Yep. <laughs> with our yeah with our suits and everything. Yep. And we lost uh, we lost Steve because of a computer <laughs> malfunction. He was set adrift. <laughs> yep. Hell, damn you. Yeah, he died. And that was really uh, sad. And Steve, you are currently teaching recording or pre-covid anyway teaching well, I, recording right uh, at- I, I i will give my title i i'm the coordinator of the bob crew program at art and music at the main college of art and i've been there since its inception that's a long name it's a long it's, title it's, I, I took a nap in the middle yeah. of that thing and i didn't even say my name in it and my middle name <laughs> and my title and my you know my royal appellations too you know yeah <laughs> sir lord of sir lord the earl of, of, of the duke the earl sir lord duke yes of the duke Reese. um uh anyway so i've been there since since its inception and helped develop that program and happily there and i help art students make sound and music that's that it's it's kind of where i need to be it's a good gig um in the name the name Bob Crew is important because he's the dude who uh, wrote most of the tunes for Frankie Valli in the Four Seasons and he produced and those produced records. Right? He, he yeah. was. He was a co- co-writer. He was a lyricist and co-writer for almost all of Frankie Valli in the Four Seasons and Frankie Valli solo stuff like Can't Take My Eyes Off You, My Eyes Adored You. Um, he co-wrote Lady Marmalade, Marmalade, whichever one. Mm-hmm. Um, he did a bunch of stuff in the 50s, the late 50s, which is kind of before my time, but uh, like the song Silhouettes he wrote. Um a bitch rider in the Detroit Wheels um, mm-hmm. produced all their stuff, and just had a like a like a twenty year or so 
writing producing career, which is kind of hard to fathom, given that music went from doo wop to disco and mm-hmm. everything in between, mm-hmm. and he survived and he had hits, hit after hit. Just so hearing that list of songs that you just rattled off, it's like a, a karaoke dream. This guy, yeah. this guy was <laughs> a living true. karaoke generator. I yeah. don't mean that as an insult either, but those are all, those are all class. I mean, I think that I've, uh, I've sung those on stage, yeah. <laughs> quote, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on a karaoke stage. Um, I also work with uh, you over at the Bob Crew Foundation for uh, Artful <laughs> m- Music uh, Learnitude for young you, young people. You have, yeah. in, med- in several capacities as who wants to record a, good <laughs> a, a pre college program instructor and as our uh, ensemble course instructor as well, basically. Leading a band of yeah. students. Yes, which was very difficult to do uh, as we shifted uh, to remote learning at the end of last yes. semester. A remote band isn't too cool. No, it's, it, it lacks mm-hmm. it lacks a little uh, everything that makes playing in a band <laughs> yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, one thing that brings us all together, as always, is a love of the Beatles. Exactly. Um, and I would say that of the countless hours that we've spent in a studio together, we've spent perhaps most of them uh, talking about the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, it's pro- yes. probably three quarters of the time talking about the Beatles and a quarter time and, 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 putting and them out music. Well, and, and, and also trying to incorporate that influence in both of your sets of music in mm-hmm. either um, obvious ways, which are because it's okay to borrow from the Beatles. It's like mm-hmm. that's kind of like what's been going on for fifty-five, well, almost sixty years. Holy crap! And um, and that vocabulary that all of us have developed. It's like just could you make that sound more Beatley? Make mm-hmm. sense to all of us, mm-hmm. <laughs> whether it's a vocal part or a piano part or an acoustic guitar part or electric guitar or anything. It's like beetle beetle it up a little bit, please. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, it's never not cool. It'll never yeah, not be exactly. cool. They're the yeah. best. The Beatles are the best. Um, and anyone who probably doesn't agree with that sentiment probably unsubscribed from this show a long time ago. Yeah, long yeah time exactly. Ago. <laughs> uh, after our uh, two-hour McCartney episode, they're the probably McCartney like, Marathon, all right, yeah, I'm out. Yeah. The two-hour <laughs> that we uh, yeah, brought down from three. Yeah, we pared down from... That's right. That, that was our two-LP version of a four-LP set. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so, Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say... Uh, First, obviously, uh, all of these qualifications that we just laid out, uh, just to let you know that uh, Steve is the right guy for us to be talking to about this new John Lennon collection. Um, But also, I I took some notes here on uh, the collection was executive produced by Yoko Ono, big surprise, Mm. uh, produced by Sean uh, Ono Lennon. And the audio engineer was Paul Hicks, who had done the remixes of Imagine for the 2018 collection, which I actually didn't get to listen to. Same. Um, and then, it's great. Um, let's see. They used new transfers from the original tapes and mixed the songs in analog at the Henson Studios in Los Angeles. And it was mastered by Alex Wharton at Abbey Road, uh, who also mastered it for the vinyl release, also at Abbey Road. So mm-hmm. there we go. There's the background on it. Yes. And as we said, oh, I, I did want to interject that uh, this whole episode it will suffice to be the bull moose hour so we'll be we'll be uh i got my copy at bull moose jones i got my copy at bull moose and i also just bought like 30 other records while i was there awesome um i I got my copy at bull moose and actually that same day i got the this is another episode a copy of the andrew gold box set that just came out andrew gold (laughs) of the golden girls theme song fame and lonely boy yeah oh (laughs) Wow. Unheralded hero that we'll talk about later. So that's a box set of two <laughs> songs. <forward> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the forty-five version, the album version, alternating about and then the dance remix, times. the twelve-inch yeah. version. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So as as Steve, what uh, version of this did you pick up? So I'm Mister Digital because ah. you guys are Mister Vinyl. I, I've since I'm a little bit older mm-hmm. to some degree. I already had my vinyl days back in the day, days of vinyl, and I love vinyl. But I am a surround sound fiend because I have multiple places to listen to surround sound Mm -hmm. in my own home, in the multiple studios I work in. So I can get to enjoy the surround mixes. So I got the the Blu-ray CD booklet version Mm -hmm. of this release. And the book here. Yes. Is it's great. It's a great book. It's like kind of like you know when you get a book and it's only pictures and like one word and you want 
or it's too many words and not enough pictures. Mm -hmm. This has lyrics, it has each song, has two pages of explanation and anecdotes and interviews, mm -hmm. and it tells you who played on them, and it tells you, it's, it's, it's perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why um, one thing I wanted to bring up, and this yeah. will be the only uh, negative thing that I will uh, say about this set, is that I have the two disc set, um, I guess now I kind of wish I'd sprung for the big one, but um, the the presentation, like the booklet, is like kind of I don't know, not I want it more. Yep. And uh, mm -hmm. and I obviously like a hundred and fifty page booklet is going to give you more information, but I could definitely have used with a little bit more of the uh, the the nerd information uh, in this book. But other and, and the the layout's like a little, it's fine, um, it's fine. I do like that they start off on, on my version. There's a copy of the uh, um, the letter that John Lennon wrote to the Queen, to Her Majesty the Queen. Your right. Majesty, I'm returning this MBE in protest against Britain's involvement in the Nigeria Biafra thing, against our support of America in Vietnam, and against Cold Turkey, which was a single at the time, uh, slipping down the charts. With love, John Lennon. <laughs> which is pretty uh, pretty cheeky thing to send to uh, the queen so it looks like the same same book that that came with mine i was i, I yeah. was definitely looking forward to the the 124 page with explanations and song breakdowns and stuff so and, you do uh, or, I, you do uh, or don't have that jones i do not have that oh. I, I bought yeah i bought the the expensive vinyl box set and it did not come with see the, that the book. that well okay let's just yeah. call that uh that's that's not good you so know? I'm thinking the best thing to do would be to um, do a review of the book on an audio podcast and just talk about what the pictures look like. <laughs> yeah. And I can hold it up. Yeah. I'll hold it up to the microphone. I've got a good microphone. We can I'm crack, pretty sure it'll We can crack translate. into that untapped market of, uh, of yeah. uh, design and layout podcasts. Yes. I can explain <laughs> the colors because it's the, the kind of the gold and yeah. black theme they have. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, so. Mine did come with a Give Me Some Truth bumper sticker yes. and three postcards and a two-sided poster. That yes, I, would I got love that to, too. So, yeah. I would love to hang up the poster, but uh, I'm like also, uh, you know, my personality is like, oh, this came in the record set, so now I have to stay with the record set. Yeah. Uh, yes, I share yeah. that as well. I use um, them. I use when them. I when, I, when, I got my, when I got my Venus and Mars reissue, uh, that I, I slapped yeah. that Venus and Mars sticker right on my acoustic guitar. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? Because that's my sticker. And you know what? You yeah, buy, exactly. you, you buy it, it secondhand, that's your problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, yeah, the, I mean, the package looks good. It's a really cool photo of, of John that I had not seen before. Um, yep. it's really cool. It's, it's a sparse layout, but like what we're here to talk about, uh, another, uh, inst instead of talking about the way things look, let's talk about the way they sound because that'll, <laughs> that'll really yeah. help, help people. Um, yeah, so I only have, I li instant karma hit, uh, Spotify, I want to say about, um, a month ago, -ish? yeah, a month or so, yeah. yeah, and and that was followed up by another a uh, mind games, yep, came out, which is one of my personal favorites of his. Um, but man, instant karma sounded fantastic. Yeah, now, I don't know about you two, but and, and Jones and I have touched on this in earlier episodes, but the uh, I am not personally a fan of the. The Beatles, uh, Sgt. Pepper, Abbey Road, and White Album remixes. I find them to be... It's interesting. It's cool to hear certain uh, elements kind of like brought more to the forefront or opened up a little bit. But I find them to generally fatigue my ears. They just... They, just, they hurt afterwards. They, they lack uh, a warmth. I don't know if it's too much information in the high end. I don't know what it is about it, but it's just like I don't... When I think about it, I do not think... Uh, of pleasurable listening. Um, and it made me want to go back and then uh, like put on the 2009 remasters, which are, for me, like the holy grail of of the way things should sound if you want them to sound good. And those just sound better to me. And maybe because I'm used to it, but they don't fatigue my ears. I just think it sounds like a, a better version of what I uh, grew up with. These mixes, however, from my standpoint... They just sound great, and I qualify that by knowing that I had no interest to go back and put the old mix of Instant Karma on and listen to it to compare it, 
because it just what I'm listening to just sounds great. So it, it, they didn't take a lot of liberties with it. They relatively, if not very faithfully, recreated the original mixes from you know the original albums. Uh, but there is a little bit more separation. Um, I would say that I don't know if we want to go track by track, but there are some some moments uh, where you know you had that like, oh, I didn't realize that there was a blank there, or uh, for instance, I didn't realize what an important uh, part of the puzzle the Rhodes electric piano was in Number Nine Dream. Yep, I had not uh, heard that before. But also very full sounding. I think Steve, it was you that you said that it sounded really rich. Yeah, I can't. I I don't know what term I use. I, I'm used to it. Luxurious. Luxurious. It's like a it's like a pillow. And I I jumped into these mixes in the surround ones immediately because I brought them back into one of the studios I work in and just listen to the surround mixes immediately because I can't do that as readily elsewhere. And it was like, ooh, low end. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. As an engineer and mixing engineer, I like low end. And I I thank Chad Blake in the 90s for reintroducing us to low end. Yes, thank you, Chad Blake. Who's a a famous mixing engineer who uh, did way too much awesome stuff to even, he still does great, 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 great stuff. And people forgot in the CD age that low end existed because they're so enamored of the crystal and high end that it was hard to do on a record mm-hmm. um, because you know vinyl records are pretty limited in their sound re- reproduction um, abilities. That's why what you're hearing is not what's really on the record. You have to apply an a EQ curve to it when you're recording and when you're playing back. But people forgot low end existed. Mm-hmm. And even in this, like this is to give this some context. You know, from 1969 to 1980, when all this stuff was recorded, with a big hole from 1975 to 1980, because um, John was on a hiatus from music, that when they were mixing some of these, they were for 45s, mm-hmm. or they were for vinyl records, and there were limitations, so you wouldn't mix technically in a certain way, because it would be harder to master, and the mastering engineer would have to get rid of some of your work. So the reason the old ones don't, they don't sound bad. They were in a, they're from a different time and were mixed for a different purpose Mm -hmm. and a different audience. Mm -hmm. And so now when I put on these new ones, it's like, oh my God, it's, it's like a Klaus Vorman record because he, Klaus Vorman, the bass player Mm -hmm. who's friend of the Beatles from the Hamburg days. um, He did the cover for Revolver. Yes. And, and Mm -hmm. yes. And then the anthologies and Mm -hmm. just, he's kind of the coolest guy ever. Um, Yeah. It's pretty cool. Because like you get to be like, one of the fifth Beatles, basically. One yep. of the many fifth Beatles. But the bass lines, you can hear the bass lines. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm a bass player. I'm a guitar player. I'm an engineer. It's like, I like bass. Mm-hmm. And, and I think some people might think it's too much. And I think it sounds great because these are remixes. So why not do something different? Mm-hmm. And they sound mm-hmm. just warm. Like It's like a big pillow. You just want to lie down. I in agree. And just like, like when, it, when it first kicked mm-hmm. in, I was like, oh, I have my bass turned up way too much. You know, and then I was like, wait, I don't. I checked it and I did not. Yep. I had, you know, yep. I even like turned the loudness off, which I usually turn, have on to make everything else sound yep. good. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and, exactly. And, but then when all of the other elements kicked in, I realized that like, no, it is not too bassy. Like there's that much bass. And then also everything else is, it's all there. Yeah. So they did a really, a really great, and I guess they, they ran, I, I presume they transferred the the tapes to Pro Tools or something like that, and but they ran it all through analog outboard gear. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know what their playback system was. I mean, I could assume it was Pro Tools. I mean, they might have just retransferred it to another analog tape, but I wouldn't have done that because yep. you would not gain. You'd only lose something then. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But listening through, so I have the, you know this has the thirty six songs in it, the 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 big CD mm-hmm. Blu Ray collection, I, and I listened to the remasters from ten years ago. Mm-hmm. And not the remixes. That's another story because they've remixed some of this stuff already, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and a beat them all. Some of them are really similar, like the later stuff, like the double fantasy stuff. Mm-hmm. They didn't, they didn't mess with it much. They made it a little warmer and a little more present with John's voice. Mm-hmm. But the early middle stuff, some of it's remarkably changed. Yes, some of it almost too much. Only there's maybe two songs. Can't remember which ones they are. Where like they deliberately made the drums really different. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing, but some of it was like the same. Nothing like, caught imagine, my ear in that way. Yeah, I didn't feel like anything like went too far. And I, I actually nope. found that like without having done an A B, and I, I actually I've been talking to Jones about this. Uh, when Instant Karma came out on Spotify, I was on a drive listening. It's like, oh, that sounds yep. great. And then the next thing up in the automatic queue was 
um, uh, one of the tunes off of the Double Fantasy Stripped Down oh, yeah, yep. mix, uh, yep. which I really enjoyed hearing it that way. Yeah. Um, because, you know, that was recorded in 1979 and 1980. Like, you know, uh, modern recording techniques were upon us. Like, they've, of yep. course, changed and developed since then. But the fundamentals haven't really changed that much since then. Like, as far as, like, quality of microphones, the size it, of a well, recording his, desk and all that kind of stuff. Historically, that was kind of the peak of analog recording. Mm-hmm. Up until about the early eight, late 70s, early 80s, that was as good as it got. Yeah. With yeah. analog recording, and I, I found the I found the 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 double fantasy. So the later mixes, the double fantasy was the last record that John put out, and is a split uh, LP with Yoko. Um, so the stripped down is very interesting to hear it kind of uh, stripped down. Um, but I also felt like there are certain things that they took out, like all the backing vocals and just like starting over. Yep. Some of the sound effects and weird things, like I kind of miss those. And they, I also like you know if you're a, a Beatle nerd like we are. You know that John Lennon was always hiding behind effects. He was not a huge fan of his own voice, the way it sounded coming out of his face. Yep. yep. So to have to kind of take that away from him, I almost felt like, oh, that's like, I don't know, that's like letting people like opening the door and letting people look at you sleep. You know, like that's kind of not how he he wanted it. Uh, But to hear all that kind of like restored and mixed well, I thought that the the later stuff really also benefited from a more warm mix rather than yep. you know the the mm-hmm. you know the the goal at the time still in like the 80s was like treble let's get as much treble in there as yeah. we can like yeah exactly you know. mm-hmm. um but i felt that they're i mean they sound like they're recorded right now it's just it just sounds yeah. awesome but then also so, the, the I'll, I'll i'll get out of your way here in just a second jones the the older stuff which was like instant karma is like a very good example of a song that was recorded very quickly early you know it was kind of like a rush job he would often or he said at one point uh you know it was uh, written for breakfast recorded for lunch and released for dinner and uh man that really benefited also everything on this set that i've heard benefited from the remix i think and jones i'm sorry to have interrupted you uh, so I, I i actually have a handful of nitpicks Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um so i mean overall i, I think the set is incredible i think it's one of the best like compiled John Lennon collections, like all 36 songs are killer. It's like, you know, if you buy no other John Lennon solo stuff, if you buy this full box set, you've got everything you need. Obviously it's sounding crisp and clear and cleaner than ever. So any of the, any of the complaints I have are straight up nitpicks, (laughs) but there are, there are a few things where I feel like the too much separation and like even like too much clarity in some cases, like takes away from some of the magic of the original mixes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first two singles, uh, Instant Karma and Mind Games, were, or at least those were the first two that I heard, um, were, I, I actually include among those two that I feel like lose a little bit of what made the original mixes special. Um, like, you know, uh, in particular, Instant Karma was, as you said, like, whatever, written for breakfast, recorded for lunch, released mm-hmm. for dinner. Mm-hmm. Um, that whole, like, process was, like, was intentional. You know, and I, I actually watched the Plastic Ono Band documentary the other night, and they were talking about that, where basically John Lennon took the rough mix mix off the desk and was like, I love it, I'm going to release it as is, mm-hmm. you know, like, and it was intentionally didn't want to overthink it or overwork it or over massage it. But it has like that sort of chaotic Phil Spector wall of sound thing going on, where like, uh, I didn't actually didn't even realize so recently George Harrison played acoustic guitar on that song. Same, yeah. Um, but the acoustic guitar is like it's like really bright and kind of biting sounding, and it mixes like it's like it's so close uh, in the stereo field with the piano that they almost sound like a single instrument. And then there's like just like all this chaotic slapback on the toms. So when those crazy drum fills happen, mm. and in the new mixes they separated that guitar and the piano, and they rolled a lot of that high end off the guitar, so it's not as biting as it was. And they took a lot of that slap back off the drums. So I feel like just some of that like exciting, chaotic nature of the original mix is now missing because it's like too clean and too clear. And also it revealed mistakes on the take that I never realized before. Oh, I... Like in the second verse, there's a bass flub. And on the third verse, there's like a, you know, a piano hits a wrong chord. Mm-hmm. Like it's like, I never heard those before. And now they're like clear as day. Like, oh, there he is fucking up. And uh, yeah, and it's to my ears, like a little bit less exciting. And there's a few tracks. I mean, that's the only one where I feel like mistakes were revealed, but they also only did like five total takes of that or maybe 10. I don't know. 
um you know it wasn't as obviously it wasn't as massaged as some of the other ones were mm-hmm. but there's there's a handful of tracks on on it that i find that the clarity and the separation almost takes away uh from from some of the urgency and excitement that i like in the original mixes see i um, I have a differing opinion there because I mean, for, and I, I don't mean to say this like, well, I heard it before, but like I was like, <laughs> you know, instant karma is like rife with mistakes. In fact, uh, that that base, that wrong base note at the top of that verse being, you can hear him like correct, like oh shit, you know? Yeah, like it's does that, um, but uh, slide back up to the note. Yeah, that happens a lot on Plastic Ono Band too, and I think what, not that I know because I wasn't there, but if I had to guess. Like John seemed to be very much like more of like a reactionary, emotional pushing for the moment, like whatever. It doesn't need to be perfect. And that mm-hmm. was probably like pushback from being uh, strapped to McCartney for so long, who is very clearly like a much more meticulous uh, craftsman in that way when it comes to performance and recording. I mean, not to say that Paul mm-hmm. couldn't rock out with the best of them. Obviously, he can. We know that he can, but like. I think <laughs> he, that that Kennedy did. Kennedy did, and will again, maybe. And but uh, but obviously, like that play between John and Paul was what made the magic. You had somebody who mm-hmm. knew how to, uh, um, I don't know, like get John to kind of like push it a little bit further and like make it like a little more uh, smooth or or what? Not smooth, but just a little more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just. Uh, refined right Mm -hmm. um but you'd have lennon kind of pushing mccartney to like just cut the shit and rock out and who gives a shit you know so they really i think benefited from each other so in a way i feel like these remixes kind of take like if the engineer had been given a proper amount of time to mix instant karma proper quote unquote yeah yeah. um Mm -hmm. because what's that mean but uh i don't know i i I like this version a lot. I, li- I love the chaos of the original. I love that it's like you can't, it's just like a big soup of music. But I also like hearing it uh, separated as well. Um, yeah. So, I mean, George Harrison did the same thing when he revisited the mixes on All Things Must Pass in whatever year it was, 2001 or two. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yep. they did the same thing where they basically stripped off a lot of the the wall of sound stuff, like the excessive reverb and slapbacks and. Mm-hmm. And I kind of had the same thought back then, even though I knew less about music. I was just like, something about this is less exciting to me. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's still brilliant music that I love. Um, and, and and this doesn't hold true across the board for me on this collection. There's just a handful of of moments where where I found it to be. Um, I guess like, okay, so I, <laughs> I I saw a thing with Brian Wilson talking about producing pet sounds. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how like, you know, if you have a guitar playing a line, that's a guitar playing a line. If you have an organ playing a line, that's an organ playing a line. If you take the guitar and the organ playing the same line and you mix them together, like in mono, mm-hmm. then it's not a guitar or an organ. It's like it's a it's, it's a guitar a thing of its own. Yes, it's exactly. a guitar organ. Yeah. But when you get into doing the remixes and you're like, oh look, there's a guitar and an organ here. I'll put the guitar left and the organ right. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, that like that new instrument that you created by combining them disappears. And and I've just I find there's like a uh, it happened in the Beatles remixes and there's a handful of spots. Uh, across this collection like um like watching the wheels for instance mm-hmm. like i it's very clear now to me that there are two piano parts in there mm-hmm. uh, yeah. because they've been separated you know before i used to think uh that was one piano part and i've sat there like trying to like figure out how to do that you know like how to how to put that together and couldn't figure it out mm-hmm. and now with the new mixes i'm like oh no wonder i couldn't figure it out it's because it's two pianos but it's like at the same time some of that magic is is lost a little bit for me. See, I, I get, have. I'll oh, go ahead, Steve. I so yeah. uh, this happens a lot when. Well, some people's like, well, you know, why would you want to repaint the Mona Lisa or whatever? It's like the cool thing about this is that they didn't erase the old mixes. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, and rid the planet of them. <laughs> we get to have both, which is the same with the Beatles stuff and everything else. And the like, I say the context of mixing. Like to me, I mean, think there's some of these that lose detail because they've. I can't remember which tune it was. It could be this, maybe like just like starting. There's a couple songs where the drums are just kick and snare and the over, there's no cymbals. So mm-hmm. They like, you didn't use mm-hmm. the overhead mic. They just like warmed it up and didn't let any air through. Mm-hmm. And it's like, wow, that's that was a decision. That wasn't a mistake that they did this year. Um, like there's two songs like that. Cold Turkey one they, of them. And yeah, and also um, I'm trying to think of um, How Do You Sleep? I think, if I, I might be mistaken, 
the song is basically in mono, mm-hmm. and then this one mm-hmm. isn't. And um, like I say, there's some stuff that would seem uh, heavy handed, but if they didn't, if they're going to remix it, they might as well do something different and give us a new product. Mm-hmm. Not just to do it, but so you can compare them. To me, like Mind Games, the original one, mm-hmm. loved it for 46 years or whatever. When I look, compare it now, it sounds like it's already on the radio. And then the new one has all this extra low end. It's like, oh, that's, I like that too. Yeah. It's like mm-hmm. yeah. gravy. It's I gravy. It is gravy. <laughs> Mind Games is kind of like my sleeper favorite John Lennon record. Yeah. I mean, I love Imagine and I love Plastic Ono Band. And uh, I have, I'm not as well versed in Walls and Bridges, though I've listened to it uh, many times, but I just haven't fallen in love with that record yet. Sometime in New York City, I haven't really i've i've done like a drive-by on that one yep um but uh mind games i love that album i I love the spirit of that album i feel like he's like at peak john lennon Mm -hmm. powers you know and uh and i love hearing those tunes specifically the title track kind of separated and pulled apart and mixed i don't know i love it I, i love that album i love hearing because uh, the bass player, the, Klaus Vorman does not play bass on Mind Games. It's a Gordon somebody, or somebody Gordon. Um, and man, he really takes that thing for a walk. Mm-hmm. He's a great bass player. Um, Jim Keltner on drums. Um, another tune, uh, oh, I, Jones, I wanted to go back to something you were saying earlier. Um, All Things Must Pass. Mm-hmm. Credited uh, Phil Spector as the producer, right? Is Credited, mm-hmm. uh, credited as the producer on that album, uh, he actually didn't even like really show up. And apparently, and, that's the yeah. same thing for Plastic Ono Bands. Yeah, yeah. And uh, George Harrison yeah. was pissed because he wanted the wall of sound, and and, and Phil Spector is entering into this new minimalist <laughs> phase of his, <laughs> you know, be, uh, the minimalist phase before he uh, went into his murderous phase. Um, <laughs> ah, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, that one, yeah, that one. Uh, I think he had a threatening murder phase before he we went to like, yeah, yeah. actual murder yeah, you phase. Don't, yeah, you don't just like kick right over you know, murder. It's, it's a gradual yeah. growth. Yeah. It lasted decades. It's very gradient. Yeah. Very gradient. Um, but yeah, so apparently uh, George Harrison was responsible for the wall of sound on All Things Must Pass. And then maybe, I don't know, maybe he was like in his 50s one day and just being like, you know what? Maybe um, maybe I overdid it there <laughs> or something. Yeah. I love the old mixes. I love the, the, the newer mixes. It's fun to hear. It's fun to hear it be different. And one thing I, yeah. I, I think that maybe we can all agree on is that none of these mixes sound bad. No, no. 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 It's, as I said, it's, any complaint I have is a nitpick because I would highly recommend this collection mm-hmm. to Plus, anybody with even a passing interest. <laughs> all of these mixes fit together. So if they didn't change them, it wouldn't sound like an album because this is a 36 yeah. song album. Yes. And mm-hmm. even though it's like, well, well, like I say, the, the double fantasy stuff, they didn't really mess with much. This kind of helped it out. But it's, and mm-hmm. it's like, because it was recorded in 1979 and 80, so it was kind of like modern. Mm-hmm. Um, but they did change it enough so it fit into this collection. But if you skip back and forth between the mid-period and then the double fantasy stuff, it's like, oh, yeah, they didn't really mess with this too much. Mm-hmm. It's a very, mm-hmm. very different experience. Mm-hmm. They didn't need to... I, I, you know, I'd like to know who, what the decision-making process was between, uh, you know... Yoko and Sean and Paul Hicks and whoever else was poking their fingers and mm-hmm. this like, oh, let's, yeah, if it's not broken, don't really fix it much. Yeah, I like that they put Sean mm-hmm. in charge of it because he's, uh, yeah. he's he, well, he's a cool dude in his own right. Um, uh, yeah. If you guys haven't checked it out yet, uh, there is a series of interviews that Sean Lennon did uh, that you can find on YouTube. I don't know what he did them for originally, but... Um, he basically he talks to Elton John and then he talks to Julian Lennon and then he talks to Paul McCartney. Oh wow! Uh, huh. All just huh. basically being like, "Who was my dad?" <laughs> you know, wow. like, yep. Yep. what was that like? And uh, it's uh, in particular the Elton interview and the McCartney interview are two of the best interviews I've heard with those guys because they're like talking to basically like a friend and family member rather than like a member of the right, press. Right. And yep. like I heard Paul McCartney tell stories to Sean Lennon that I've never heard him say before. Oh, wow. Huh. And so many of like the things that he says are like almost cliche now because he said them so many times. That's right. Um, right. I was a little underwhelmed with the Julian Lennon interview only because, not because of Julian, but just because I feel like Sean definitely showed like a, a respect to, to McCartney and Elton as like, you know, elder statesman musicians, mm-hmm. whereas he talked to Julian as if they were, you know, well, they are, like, I guess, kind of like just on the same level. He didn't have the same sort of uh, 
yeah, they're brothers, I guess. So he, <laughs> yeah. 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 But I felt like he he kind of dominates that conversation a little bit more than I would have liked, rather than just letting Julian speak mm-hmm. the way that he let Elton and, and Paul speak. But it's still, yeah, it's like an hour and a half, but totally worth listening to. I found it last night, and yeah. it, it was great. I'll, ch- I'll definitely check that uh, out. I, I was hoping, actually. Well, first, of all, I want to reiterate that I have the the two disc uh, nineteen song vinyl that i got at bull moose zach you got the 36 song 4 lp version mm-hmm. also bull moose and steve you got the how many cd uh two cds and one blu-ray and and then that came with the 5,000 page booklet full color yes yeah yep. um is the booklet bound or is it just a bunch of loose pages like most it is books ba- it's it's a book Oh wow! So it's bound. Okay, cool. It's a real. It's like a. It's like a. Um. It's like a ten. Uh, well, maybe nine. Nine or ten inch coffee table book. Yeah. So it's for a small coffee. For like a teacup book. Yeah. Uh, mo- most <laughs> books that I buy are not bound. They're just kind of just like loose yeah. leaves, just stacked. Um, yeah. which is fine until it gets windy or you turn a fan on in the summer. Um, yes. And then you have to put the books back together. So I'm glad to hear this one's bound. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the future of books. But I was hoping to. <laughs> <find it. laughs> I was hoping to point. I had a couple of uh, uh, takeaways from from this uh, listen, and I was hoping yep. uh, to talk to. Uh, hold on one second. I'm getting a noise. Stop it with the noise. It's the phone noise, guys. You know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. This is terrible. Ah, oh, whatever. You probably can't hear it. It's actually on your phone line. Uh, so sorry about that. Uh, I had a couple of takeaways. I mean, aside from like, uh, man, when they remastered it, it sure didn't fix the, they didn't tune up that saxophone on, uh, power to the people. Holy, nope. holy crap. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also the other tune that saxophone is on, uh, whatever gets you through the night. I don't know who John yep. Lennon was, uh, the, those, I, I don't personally, again, this is nitpicking. But like, I don't think that dude has the best relationship with woodwinds. Uh, I think that that was uh, uh, Bobby Keys, who also played with the Rolling Stones. Yeah, okay. And uh, apparently, he got along with Keith Richards <clears throat> really well because they had the same substance addictions. Ah, shocker! It sounds <laughs> like it. It sounds like it. Yeah. Um, he was also the on the Mad Dogs and Englishmen uh, tour. Yeah, like, he, was, he was kind of like. I think he it, people like to party with him, so they hired him to play sax on all the records. It sounds it, that's exactly yeah. what it sounds like. It sounds like he's yeah. angry at the saxophone and he's trying to uh, push it into another song or something. I don't know. Um, but I've also I also just have an aversion to like that yakety sax sound. Like it's just not my <laughs> it's not my vibe. It took me years to separate that from Saturday Night Live. Um, every, yes. every time I hear that, it's like, Saturday hence, Night Live. Spencer, hence your dislike for listening to what the man said. Okay, well, okay, which I, let, which I love. Let me pull this apart. That's another. Uh, that's, a, that's another uh, subject. There's two. There's two things I don't like about listening to what the man said. The sax solo, which is on a soprano sax, which is my least favorite <laughs> yes. version of one yep. of my least favorite instruments. Now that said, <laughs> if you if there there are great sax players out there, and I've had the pleasure yeah. of playing with uh, some yep. of them, and when it's played right, it's amazing and awesome. Uh, when it's played wrong, it is uh, soul crushing. <laughs> um, like more so than most other instruments. Uh, like violin probably and saxophone played poorly is. Uh, I don't even want to yeah. be anywhere near that. So that's just my own <laughs> opinion. But but yeah, uh, listen to what the man said. It's a soprano sax, <laughs> and then also the way he says man. Man, listen to what the man, <laughs> man. I don't like. He's it. he's from he's from England. He talks. Yeah, for well, I don't like it. Uh, so, <laughs> so a couple of uh, uh, so again, no shade to saxophone players out there, no, established no. or otherwise. Keep following your dream, and for the yep. love of Christ, don't play out of tune. Uh, <laughs> that kind of goes to all musicians. <laughs> but my 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 uh, no, just sax players. Everyone else can play out of tune. <laughs> But uh, number nine dream for me was probably my favorite. Uh, well, I don't know. Just like starting over was great too. But number nine dream, I was just like, it's a song I've listened to thousands of times, hundreds at, at least, um, and I love that song. But I didn't really realize, like I said, like the, I said earlier, that that Rhodes part was so integral mm-hmm. to the arrangement. But then also, I've always known the string arrangement was outstanding, but like. Yep. It is. I, I, I didn't 
look up who did that string arrangement on that tune, but it is incredible. I'm not sure. It, mm-hmm. it is so uh, cinematic. Like they really, it does feel like a dream. The whole tune feels like a dream. All the backwards tape stuff and the whispers and and speaking in the the I don't even know what language that is. Uh, I don't know dream language. Dream language. I, I, don't, I don't either. Yeah, yeah. which is great. Um, but then the other my other takeaway was, and this is just because of my own unfamiliarity with the catalog. Uh, but grow old with me, uh, which originally mm-hmm. appeared on Milk and Honey. Yep. yep. I did not um, realize I had not heard that song before, or if I had, I hadn't paid attention to it. And so the version on here has a, a string arrangement by uh, George Martin, mm-hmm. uh, which is that was done for the John Lennon anthology. That's right. Which came out. That's right. I can't remember. When, it, but I have it somewhere. It is <laughs> what a tearjerker. And I was already like listening to it, like, man, this is so great. And I read a a, a, a piece that said that Yoko said that they, had they realized this song to its fullest potential, that it was their intention to have it be the song that played in churches every time people got married. Like they wanted it to be a standard. And I really yeah. think it, it, it could have been. It's incredible. But what I was already feeling the feels at this point because I already made my way through like the whole, you know, it's, it's effectively chronological until you get on my version here, until you get to the last two songs that finishes up with a, a happy Christmas and then give peace a chance. But uh, Grow mm-hmm. Old With Me, it was like, oh man, this song is so. I don't know. It's it's funny to hear John sing, not sing earnestly, which he does, but just like it's almost like he was kind of venturing into like the, the like the McCartney like sentimental territory in a way, or 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 what you know we've kind of grown to uh, expect of McCartney, right? Mm-hmm. But it's it's such a great song. But then also, uh, what I learned, what I wanted to share with you, and maybe you also know this, but if if you're listening and you don't know this. When they were doing uh, the anthology, and as you know, there are two new Beatles songs, quote, new Beatles songs on the anthology, uh, Free as a Bird and Real Love. Um, And then there was another tune that they worked on but abandoned because the tapes were too uh, degraded. Um, But Grow Old... George Harrison didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. I think that might have been it. Which is great that you can still be like, you know, even though it's like, you're still in the Beatles, and you can still say, I don't like that song. <laughs> yeah, Throw it out. <laughs> uh, but Grow Old With Me was, was one of the tunes. And this is what got me right in the feels department, fellas. Yoko presented the tape, these tapes of John singing these demos to Paul. And on the tapes written in John's hand writing was for Paul. Oh, wow. 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 Can you imagine? Like, I bet... Like that must have been like huh. so emotional. Like to think that like, yeah, yeah. Like what? Like had he thought? D- did she arrange to have his handwriting put on there, or did John, even late in his life, like be like, I want Paul to hear these songs? Like, are mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's just yep. I don't know. That must have been a, a like a remarkably touching moment because um, that that is that's the I think that they did a really good job. Again, like kind of coming through chronologically but then also ending it on a really like beautiful like sentimental note like the very last thing you mm-hmm. hear from John almost on this record is uh uh him like kind of like I was singing from beyond the grave you know it was released posthumously mm-hmm. and uh it's just like this tender really beautiful song and then he says uh then he says merry christmas to you which is very nice and then and then <laughs> then he's like saying like hey give peace a chance which is uh i don't think people have tried that still even though he's been that he put he he put that on the table a long time ago Mm -hmm. i'm so glad that the the the, uh, compilation it's mostly chronological but they put the two older songs at the end especially give peace because when you do it when you do john lennon completely chronologically the first five songs are so predictable and they can't it's kind of tiring to hear those same songs in that order yes um, and it's like, yeah, throw, give peace a chance at the end because it, so it has some more meaning mm-hmm. as opposed to way early on. And you don't want to hear a Christmas song on a compilation in the midst of it because it's kind of like it's July, mm-hmm. even though this message isn't really just about Christmas, it's about yeah. you know, ending war. Mm-hmm. But it, it was so thoughtful. It's like, we have to have these songs here, but let's not put them in the front. Mm-hmm. Let's put them, mm-hmm. yeah, they put them, at, they put them in a the perfect place. They, they, like, they put them mm-hmm. over the credits. Basically, if this were yeah, a movie, yeah. Um, 
I will also say, at the risk of sounding blasphemous, like uh, Happy Xmas War is Over is a song that I personally didn't need to hear again. Um, yep. And maybe, like, I'm in an unusual position because of my my annual dedication to learning these songs. <laughs> uh, like, for instance, you were mentioning that you didn't realize that the, the two pianos on Watching the Wheels, like, I very specifically remember that. That was actually, like, really echoed... Um, when I heard the stripped uh, version of Double Fantasy, they did, they took out the CP70, which is an electric piano. It's a string mm-hmm. piano with pickups in it. Um, but that's the one that's like more forward in the mix. So it's, yeah, playing the line. Right, yeah. right. So there is no like John wasn't playing the line originally in that, assuming that mm-hmm. he was the piano player um, on that. Sounds like him. Now yeah, that I can hear now that I can hear the piano player yeah, very clearly. He's a really good piano player. <laughs> yeah. Like underrated, yeah. I think. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, uh, I kind of got derailed there. Sorry, I was just thinking. There's so much to like think about with this. Jones, did you have any tunes in particular that that really um, uh, buttered your buns? Uh, yeah, well, so uh, you know, obviously, I was complaining earlier about how in in certain cases uh, too much separation ruins the magic for me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but obviously, there are plenty of cases where it's completely. Hang on, my phone is not on. Do not disturb. But it keeps vibrating. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, now it's on do not disturb um, uh, yeah there's obviously uh, a handful of cases where the separation is is very very welcome and uh, Steve had mentioned um, how do you sleep earlier mm-hmm. and that is definitely one of them um, having the electric piano panned left and the electric guitar panned right mm-hmm. is a uh, I mean that's another George Harrison playing guitar on it and his guitar part is like clear as day now mm-hmm. and it's so excellent to hear like the those two parts the piano and the, the guitar playing off each other mm-hmm. on either side instead of just both jammed down the middle um, and then you know uh, yeah as I mentioned there's like for me like mind games is, is another one though where like the separation I find kind of hurts it a little bit because the combination of the strings and the slide guitar together mm-hmm. produced like this like i don't know just magical like made me feel like i was floating on a cloud kind of sound mm-hmm. and now with the slide guitar hanging out by itself in the middle it just sounds like a boring repetitive slide guitar part um it just it lost a little bit of like that yeah that kind of feeling of, of floating i guess mm-hmm. um but I feel like I was going to say something else, and I can now not think of what it is. Mm-hmm. So, uh, oh, are you sure you oh. weren't going to uh, call another one of John Lennon's guitar parts boring? Oh no, <laughs> okay. I know what I was going to say. <laughs> is uh, there there was one big creative decision on this uh, that I found really surprising, which was uh, "Stealing Glass" has always been one of my favorite songs, mm-hmm. and that's a, a mix that I never thought was broken. Uh, but it was still even on this this one when it came up, I was like, wow, this this string arrangement arrangement is huge and it's so like you know they they spread that out and yeah just made it takes over the room when those strings come in but uh i realized like halfway through the reason the strings were shining so brightly is because the brass is completely missing like there's a uh uh yeah it just the the horn part on the original mix is as prominent as the string part and that is just not on this version or this representation of the song full disclosure i have um, not heard uh, how do you sleep or uh, stealing glass because it's not on my uh, my uh, budget bin two disc. Or... <laughs> <laughs> uh, did uh, did you catch that at all, Steve? That the, the, the yeah, brass is funny. missing from stealing, I, stealing so glass. I I am not a walls and bridges. I haven't. I have not lived that album. Mm-hmm. I love um, that album because and I, I like it. It's like I I like because actually like number nine dream. It's like because I was a kid when that came out. It was on the radio. It's like what is this? Mm-hmm. This is like, it was like, it was like being on a dream. Like I spent, I think all of us did at a certain age from about five, like the, well, the, I specifically remember the intro to the age of Aquarius, mm-hmm. you know, the mm-hmm. fifth dimension, like what that would come on and be like, what is going on? This is mm-hmm. amazing. This is magic. Mm-hmm. And then also going all the way through like number nine dream. I was probably 10 when that came out. Um, it's like, what is this? It's like you'd listen to the radio, and just be like a freaking out. Like it's like being be on a drug <laughs> trip or something. Mm-hmm. A drug? What are those drug trips? Yeah. Um, but but that album I don't know really well. But I remember even when it came out, I was like, "Who's this John Lennon guy?" He's like, he's not as warm and fuzzy like Paul McCartney. So I need to give that about thirty five years to warm up <laughs> <Yeah>. to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
But when I put on the steel and glass surround mix, it blew my ass out. It was like, it was, you know, I was like, whoa. And actually another note. It blew so your, on it blew, the, oh, hold on. It blew your ass out of what now? It's like, specifically? I, it's like, it's like uh, <laughs> your <is> it, pants, <laughs> it blew chair? my ass into place. I don't know. It, it glued my ass to the seat. I'm not sure. Right. I'm not sure it was my ass or just some other part or of my someone body. else's ass. Yeah. <laughs> or um, the rest of the universe yeah. uh, around your but, ass. <laughs> so on the Blu-ray, they give you the super high quality stereo mix and mm-hmm. they give you the, I can't remember if it's a DTS HD mix. And then they give you the Sony Atmos mix. Oh, fun. Which on like Abbey Road surround mixes, didn't, I didn't really notice it. But the Atmos mixes on this, and I don't know if it's done wrong or if it's, the Atmos mixes are like so tactile and Im- immersive and the rear channels are louder and i listen to steel and glass like what is this mm-hmm. it like i when i can share it when we can all hang out together in the same room it's like come and listen to the whole album but mm-hmm. it's like whoa and then you kind of don't miss if there's any brass missing it's like i don't care i'll listen yeah. to the old mix mm-hmm. well that's um, the thing like it, it definitely that song hit me as one of the highlights of of the record when it came on yeah and uh and yeah, and then halfway through the song, I was like, the brass is missing. And maybe that's why the strings are shining through so brightly and filling up the room the way they are. But at the same time, I really like that brass part. Mm. But yeah, as you said, the old mix there's, exists. There's one tune. I can't remember what it is. It could even be like whatever gets you through the night or something where there's a guitar part that's kind of missing now. It's, just, it's so blended in. It was like it was like an offbeat kind of re- jank, jank, kind of a mm-hmm. Motown mm-hmm. between Motown and reggae. I can't remember what song it is, but it's like in the new mix, like, oh, it's kind of blended in somewhere mm-hmm. as opposed to being sharp and in your face it's like i don't really care but that was a decision that somebody made yeah it wasn't a mistake that, you know the same thing with the backing vocals on uh woman uh yeah. in the original mix there's very prominent like ooh ooh backing vocals mm-hmm. happening yeah. that yeah. are somebody decided to not have them as far up front mm-hmm. on the new well, mix well in, in the booklet mm-hmm. you know, yoko explains yeah. that she wanted them to well to have john's voice more present Mm-hmm. And it is. It's a. Lo- it's great because sometimes he would bear. He would say, "Put that back in the mix if he had the choice." Yeah, yeah. It put put a bunch mm-hmm. of punch a bunch of slap back delay on this, and then put me back in the mix. Like, well, no, mm-hmm. we're gonna make you loud because you're awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I I think the the double fantasy mixes. Uh, there's there's something about that period of time in in, in pop culture and recording. That I don't know what it is. It's like none none of what co- cocaine. Yeah, I, I mean, I wasn't doing cocaine at the time that I. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but, you know. but the people mixing records, maybe yeah, maybe maybe it's maybe it's the cocaine uh, coming through. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, if that if that's true, then then there is a way that you can do cocaine and have it be healthy for you, and that's listening to the music of people on cocaine <laughs> without any of the negative side effects <laughs> of cocaine. Um, I guess I would like want kind of want to. Uh, I mean, obviously, like, we we could go song to song and talk about everything uh, in in great depth, but. Um, I would like to kind of stick the landing on this uh, by, I mean, personally, I'm I'm kind of of the if it ain't broke school. Like I said, with the 2009 remasters, I feel like they did a great job. They they mastered the the Beatles catalog for the digital age such that it sounded like it was supposed to when it came out on record when it came out. Like I had a, I think I've told you both this, but I had a. Uh, a pressing of a, a British pressing of Hey Jude, um, brand new, uh, first pressing mint. And I put on the, you know, in a level balanced situation, I put on that record and the remaster of Hey Jude at the same time, just a bead back and forth. And it was like, almost like, nope, these, they sound the same in, in, in a good way. Um, but mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to like my old version from the 1987 issued CD, um, I also like, as a curiosity, I I I am people, the, remix whatever you want. Like I'll I'll check it out. Like I I would love to hear more talented engineers get a crack at, you know, not named Martin, get a crack at mixing, uh, Beatles stuff like Chad Blake. Same. Let's get let's give Chad Blake the White Album. That would be amazing. But, so like I I also don't just love it because it's new. Like I've said with the Beatles remixes, I'm not, uh, the, I just, I'll listen to them out of curiosity, but I'll always go back T- to this point. I haven't heard anything that makes me want to live with that. I will probably hang out with this record for a while 
Um, and if I were to do a like a, a review, a one to five stars, I'm going to go ahead and give this. A, I'm going to go ahead and give it four stars. Ah, what what are you de- uh, taking away a star for? Just the your your earlier packaging complaints? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> no, I'm gonna put that in there because it is a collection. But if if if, if it's the material, it's it's four and a half stars. Because yeah, I'm also I, I, I'm also a little bit. I'm wondering why uh, they they remixed so many of the songs, which equals almost all of them, but didn't just re. Why didn't they just remix everything? Like do it all. Mm-hmm. Like there's there's they, they 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 will and they're gonna sell it to us. Damn it! Because <laughs> because well because they called the Imagine release. Was it last year or two years ago? They called it the uh, ultimate mixes. Ago. These are the ultimate mixes, and the Imagine are the ultimate mixes. Yep. And I haven't A B them to see if they're exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Um, I was curious about that. Because I just didn't, the same engineer. I, I forgot to do it. And so I think mm-hmm. they're going to give us Plastic Ono Band ultimate mixes and you know Mind Games ultimate mixes. Yeah. And we're going to buy them. Well, yeah. Now I'm and, now I'm glad like yeah. that I bought this two disker as opposed to you suckers who. Just shelled out all those bucks. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to spend it all again. Not me. Guy got the book. Yeah, well, I can read. Yeah, I, still I can don't read have now. The book, so I'm gonna have to. Uh, what would you, uh, Steve? What would you would you say for a for a grade? A four to a, a zero to five. I would give it a solid four and a half. Okay. Yep. And only taking off a half a star for the couple songs where they made some deliberate changes that I. Like actually, ninety five percent of the changes as an engineer, I would have done that if someone said, "Steve, remix these." If I would have done it this good of a job, I'd be like, mm-hmm. "I, I, this is the best work I've ever done." Yeah, crowning achievement. And um, <laughs> and so it's like, uh, and it sounds like I would do it today, not like I would do it in nineteen seventy one, but like I'd do it today. Mm-hmm. And only take off a half a star for um, a couple songs where they sort of took away some of the detail. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, mm-hmm. why'd you do that? It's like, and I think they did to make it cohesive, but it's like, well, you could have also not done that. So yeah, yeah. four and a half, mm-hmm. four and a half. How about you, Bones? Uh, I'm on the exact same page as Steve. Uh, four and a half. I mean, I, I'm bummed out that I didn't get the booklet in my expensive four LP collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, but on top of that, I, like, I, I think it's a wonderfully compiled collection. I think it sounds excellent from start to finish. Any complaint that I have is definitely a nitpick. It's not like a, a make or break mm-hmm. deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there, there are a few instances where the changes that they made to remove some of the detail, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, four and a half stars, totally worth it. All right. Well, bull moose. That's right. <laughs> this is, yes. Yeah. Just nice plug. Bull moose. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need to know. Need to know. Have it. It's like, if I have any money, bull moose will eventually have my money. Oh yeah. And I will have <laughs> music and books and things in my collection and movies in my collection. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So this has been your bull moose hour. Um, <laughs> yes. Steve, thank you for uh, uh, chatting with us about this, and you should come come by again soon. And we- uh, thanks, thanks for having me. And I want to let you know this is like this is like cliche. It's like I'm not just a cl- I'm a fan. I love I love your podcast. It's fun for me because I get to hang out with you guys. Like I mean, right now we're hanging out on video. Mm-hmm. And uh, just listening to you guys talk, basically, there's only you know, there's like a third of things I don't agree with you on when you're going through stuff. Only, so. only a third. <laughs> only it's like a third. It, it's funny. well, it, well, because there's three people in the mind, and like because you know, Close Encounters. Yes, but also I can't, you know. Yep. E. T. Yeah, yeah. Uh, e. T. And though. actually, and and it's like, and I'm sorry, the Turkey Club did not make it to close to the top. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, but. I couldn't. But bo- most, and also, um, Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, needs to be there. Kind of needs yeah. to be there. <laughs> so we should do an episode where people come on and complain about our previous episodes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'd be happy to do that. Yes, <laughs> Let, let's facilitate trolling. Yeah. Uh, all right, gentlemen. Well, thank you very much. Great it's to be been here. A pleasure. Right. Thank you both. Bye. It's time for happy hour, presented by Main Spirits. Why, hello there. Why, hello there. Why, hello there. You might be asking. Well. Hello there, because it's happy hour. You've made it to the end of the show, which means you deserve a reward after listening to us talk for an hour and change. Uh, yeah, we do this every week. Happy hour brought to you by Maine Spirits. Maine Spirits bring all of the great liquors and spirits into the great state of Maine. And uh, we're going to show you how to make a delicious cocktail in the comfort of your own home. 
This week, we are going to make a drink called the Quill Riff. Um, so let's get our tools together. We're going to need a tumbler, a bar spoon, a jigger, and a rocks glass. And for ingredients, we'll need the following. London Dry Gin, Dolan Blanc Vermouth, Luxardo Bitter Bianco, Absinthe, and a grapefruit for a twist. Let's build this thing. In a shaker full of ice, add one and one half ounces of London Dry Gin, one ounce of Dolan Blanc Vermouth, three quarters of an ounce of Luxardo Bitter Bianco, and stir them until cold, very cold. Now take your rocks glass and pour some absinthe in and swirl it around. Not a lot, just like a little bloop. Swirl it around and then dump it out. So you've given yourself a rinse. Now take the shaker with the contents still in it and put a strainer over the top of it and uh, strain the contents into the glass. Now garnish that with a nice rich swath of your grapefruit twist. And as you get close to the glass, squeeze it so the oils come out and then rim the glass with it, drop it in. Let's take a sip. And it's fantastic. Gin is often thought of as a summertime drink, but you know what? I think that it stands all seasons. Um, it's a, it's a yes, a clear and light and refreshing liquor, but it also is very herbaceous. There's a lot of body to uh, certain gins, um, and I think it's a, I think it's a year-round drink. That's what I say. So, to learn more about this drink and many other drinks, you can log on to mainspirits.com. You can download their app for your smartphone or follow them on Instagram at main underscore spirits. And as always, we're going to encourage you to drink deliciously and responsibly. Spencer and Zach Explore the Universe is brought to you by Main Spirits, Bull Moose, State Theater Portland, Maine, Sun Tiki Studios, and the Maine Music Alliance. This show is a Mistakes Were Made production.